now you can hear me. Okay. Um, let me just make a quick announcement. Yesterday, um, I think two of the speakers maybe took these units back to the hotel. Is that, did anybody not turn theirs back in? Okay, so just today, just make sure at the end of today that they get returned. Thank you. They, they won't work to hear Armenian anywhere else anyway, so <laughs> you may as well return them. <laughs> Well, yesterday was such an invigorating day. It was really exciting, and I think we're all happy to be continuing this symposium today. Um, our session this afternoon, this is the fourth and final session, is called Preventing Work-Related Illness in Construction Workers. And we have four speakers with probably, I don't know, 5,000 years of experience in, in crammed into these four lives. When I read their bios, it's... It's quite overwhelming. <coughs> so our speakers, we have four speakers, Anders Englund, Carol Rice, George Poligian, and Denny Dobbin. And our first speaker is Anders Englund. And he comes from Sweden. Um, his talk is called Health Risk Among Construction Workers. He served for 10 years as the Director of Medical and Social Affairs for the Swedish Work Environment Authority and has been involved in health and safety issues in the construction industry as medical director of the Nationwide Occupational Health Service for Construction Trades established by Swedish social partners. He's served on many boards having to do with cancer prevention and cancer control. He is a fellow and previous executive board member of the Collegium Ramazzini, and in 2006 was awarded the Ramazzini Prize for preventive work in construction work safety and health. So I present Dr. Englund. And, and executive director of UICC in Geneva, thank you. <laughs> many, many. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, as I am the oldest one in the panel, I suppose, and we were all together 2,000, you can imagine how old I am. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you for uh, uh, bringing up this issue of health and safety in construction. It's a theme rather often forgetten, forgotten. And I am very thankful to have been given the opportunity to contribute to this meeting. So, hmm? Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, <coughs> at the hotel we are living across the street, they are building a house, a residential house, four or five stories, uh, stories high. And uh, I was really very surprised to see that there is a magnificent modern crane bringing things up to the highest level, but there is no safety precaution whatsoever. No hard hats, no fencing to prevent them from falling down, a very simple wooden um, uh, piece for climbing up, etc. So I imagine if this is what it looks like here in the middle of the capital, it might be rather poor safety thinking in the construction trades outside in the country as well. Uh, uh, residential and uh, commercial houses is of course an important part of what is done in construction industry. A lot of uh, infrastructural activities going on. And I'm just going to show you, as I find, three wonderful slides showing how construction industries are dealing with everything between sky and the uh, earth level and even beneath. This is unloading concrete at uh, station, mountain station up at the Mont Blanc in the Swiss French Alps. This is a bridge connecting Sweden with Denmark and the European continent. And this is even beneath the earth level. It's the French entrance to the channel to Britain while it was towards the end of its construction. Uh, there are some characteristics which are important here to keep in mind. The work sites are non-permanent, locations are changing, and in particular cha hazards are changing as the project proceeds. And in general, in most countries, the employees are short-term affiliated, employed, and not permanent. 
and they are changing employers when they go to a new project. What I'm going to talk with you about is how we have the I in Sweden back to the end of the 60s, which means some 45 years perspective in dealing with these things. And it might be appropriate to uh, talk a lot about the past when I see what I see from the hotel opposite the street about the conditions here in construction. There are three areas to discuss, accident prevention, prevention in field of ergonomics, and to this I also include uh, noise and vibration, and then prevention in the field of the chemical hazards. And as you know from the program, we are going to have additional in-depth uh, presentations on both ergonomics and some of the chemical hazards I will mention. Starting with the fatal accidents, European 15 is a old group of countries. And as you can see in addition to construction, it's agriculture and transport that has got the high incidence rates of fatal accidents. Uh, if you just compare construction with the rest of the industries, uh, you can see that it is just about half. It's the red line here. Uh, it's uh, double the incidence of the rest of the industry. And uh, if I take my own country, Sweden, and looking back to the uh, early 80s, you can see that we used to have something like 20, 25 fatalities a year, and that you could have seen uh, on uh, other pictures that that was a very pretty good figure in European uh, circumstances. Uh, uh, lately then, from the mid, early 90s, they are just about half, and that looks very good, say 12 a year. And there was a very interesting remark from the president of the Construction Workers Union just a month ago when they were in the middle of their negotiations about salaries and, and working conditions. He said, in which other sector of activity in our country would you accept and be happy with one person being killed at work every month? You wouldn't even in other high-risk operations. So then we have the uh, non-fatal accidents, and there you can see that Sweden, which is quite to the right, has a, a, a fairly low figure. Uh, and uh, countries like Spain and France are pretty high. Luxembourg is a bit strange. I mean, they don't have any construction workers themselves, more or less, I think, because they are coming from outside working in this small country. So my point here is that statistics on non-fatal accidents are much more difficult to compare. And as you can see here, uh, it's the same countries, but there are different uh, age periods, and they differ a lot up and down. And uh, changes in regulations in the insurance scheme mean a lot to the actual figures for a particular year. Again, here is Sweden is very low. Uh, uh, the Netherlands, do you see that here, uh, is a very low country. Uh, that's it, the Netherlands is a very low country, for instance. And the way the social insurance is taking care of the um, suffering people means a lot to this type of statistics. I think this is a very interesting slide, which I got from an American friend, showing how the fatal accidents have declined somewhat over the years but the non-fatal ones have declined much more. And that's a bit strange. You would expect them to be in a way parallel. And the pr explanation from some of my friends there is that this is mainly uh, uh, due to uh, less reporting. Because if you report, you get in a bad shape. You pay more to insurance. You are less likely to get the jo good jobs because the whole uh, system of, of, of getting a job in federal agencies, for instance, is to show a good safety record. I will give you a few examples from our own area that you can do things safely. As you see here, 6,000 man years, not a single accident. It is a real, that's a real figure. I have myself been walking down this slope when it was almost ready. It's a bridge up in the north of Sweden, and it's a wonderful river that it is covering. The reason why this was such a good safety example is that the guy who was uh, in charge of the whole operation was very careful in safety. Whenever he got a new person coming in, he took them into his office, told them about the safety rules, and he said, 
If I see you out there without a hard hat once, I give you a warning. If I see you twice, you are gone. This is a bridge I showed before between Sweden and Denmark. And uh, this is interesting because there were two different contracts over this period. And as you can see, by the way, the previous bridge was built in the early 90s and just after came this bridge. And in fact, this contractor, which had such a good record compared to that one, was managed by the same man who did the previous bridge. So the way you treat this is very important for safety. At any time, day, any time, anywhere in the world, safety is a clear-cut barometer of organizational excellence. There can't be an excellent organization that has a lot of accidents. These are words coming from India, imagine. So my point here with regard to accident prevention is that the people at, in charge at the work site should be able to handle that by themselves. However, when we get to the uh, uh, ergonomics and the chemical hazards field, then you need assistance. And you mentioned the yesterday when you talked from WHO that uh, occupational health services are an important tool. In the European Union terminology, it's multidisciplinary services. And already 45 years ago, as you alluded to, the social partners in construction industry in Sweden decided to make such a multidisciplinary service, occupational health service, covering the whole country, all trades. And these are the numbers of the experts that were involved. And uh, to be able to make the type of health surveys that you also mentioned in the WHO presentation yesterday. There were mobile units, some 12 of them covering the whole country in addition to the stationary places. And the medical examinations data here have been used for follow-up in epidemiological surveillance, matching it with cancer registry, like we heard from Norway, with mortality figures, etc. And the data from these examinations were from the very beginning a very important tool in telling the industry uh, what the problems were. And I will come back to a very good example of how it was being used. Uh, we um, tried to describe the environment with a kind of profile. Five is the highest. Squares are measured. These triangles are uh, uh, assessed by experts like physiotherapists, engineers, etc. So that was a way of trying to categorize which were the worst. This man was working in the end of the 60s, I would say. Uh, you see, it is uh, not a good working situation. No hard hat, no respirator, uh, vibration indeed, no noise protection, and a bad back. And that's what we started with. And I hope that you are not still in this country on this level. If you are, you really have to move ahead. Uh, very early, the first year or so, 40,000 examinees from those buses and stations, we found that the bricklayers ha were having a high rate of low back pain. And other measurements made show that it was quite a difference to work like that compared to working like that, not having to bend so much. So what was done was uh, arranging a kind of gliding scaffold on the side of the wall. This is what it looked like. So the man could use taking the block, the brick, and the uh, uh, other things and put it in place without having this trouble. Uh, later on in the late 80s, early 90s, much more sophisticated data were taken up. And again, you can see here that the uh, brick layers are pretty high, but the floorers, and in particular the roofers and the scaffolders were even higher. And if you take the neck disorders by occupation, you can see that crane operators had a big problem because they had something like that, as you know. Insulators was another group with a high rate. And the painters, you can imagine, they worked like that. And again, the scaffolders. Uh, one guy type of activity was welding, uh, particularly for the pipe fitters. And when they worked in the conven conventional welding, which was just up under the ceiling, there was a lot of load on the upper extremities, but also here. But another welding way, like this, gave a much more favorable situation for them. And now we come back to this gentleman. If you went to the uh, end of the 80s, this would be what it looked like. 
suppose there was a hard hat when you noise protection, uh, and above all, the vibration and the back flow was taken away. Of course, you can't take this big machine into every little place, but as you can see, it's possible to bring it in in quite small places. Uh, I mentioned that noise is an important problem, an important problem in construction because it's not as if in the stationary industry you uh, get the noise away. Here the noise will ever always be around, so you really have to take care of the personal protection equipment. And at the same time as people had their medical examinations, they also were trained, informed by our nurses that they should use this. And in fact, measurements like uh, hearing capacity, and by the way, even the respiratory test were used as a tool to persuade the workers that you need to be careful here. And here you can see the difference between the first couple of years and a 10 year, 15 year period later. And in the age groups where you really had had an important, important uh, possible impact, you can see that the rate of severe ear capacity has uh, improved a lot. So if we go to the uh, chemical hazards, we, we have to think about the skin, the respiratory tract, and the central nervous system. Skin, I would say that it's the cement and the isocyanates that were our problem. Uh, the uh, skin uh, cement, there are two points here. It was the ceronium-6 caused allergic reaction, and it was the alkaline character of this black cement. The ceronium-6 and cement was handled in all the Scandinavian countries very early by adding ferrosulfate and reducing the chromium-6 to chromium-3, and you got rid of the problem. Later on, Germany followed with the Waldrufenerzenschaften, and later on, much later on, you got the whole European Union. I have always been so surprised that it has been completely impossible in the United States to get the industry to add the ferrosulfate uh, and the chromium-6. I followed it closely as a, a technical advisory board member of the CPWR, and I always come up with a question. And Portland Cement says it's impossible. Europe has shown it it is. Respiratory tract, you, uh, we have heard already yesterday from uh, in the presentation of the lung diseases that uh, cement dust and silica dust, etc., is causing COPD, and we also have some of the cancers here. And with regard to asbestos, I will come back later on. Central nervous system, solvents, you know, solvents in paints was a problem for the painter. And again, in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, very early, it was decided that we have to change from solvent-based products to water-based products. And it was even programmed to retrain the painters to use a new type of products because they were not happy with the results they got before they knew, were uh, taught how to do it in another way. So this was a very important and very successful uh, step taken. You are not supposed to read this, but this is in fact what it looks like if you try to plot the different construction work types and different chemical products. You see, it's, it's like shooting, and uh, some of them goes everywhere, uh, and uh, like noise and some others. But this is just to illustrate that construction industry is a very complex industry in this respect. The lung carcinogens in the construction industry, I don't have to repeat those because it was nicely presented yesterday by IRC, but I wanted to add painter, that in one, because painter as a trade is also in one of those uh, uh, monograms. Uh, we have, um, as I said, followed up the uh, records from the medical surveillance system with cancer registry and found our own data, which I come back to. But I also fairly recently made a paper for the European Journal where I summarized oral cancer in construction industry from other sources. And I would say that all types of studies from different parts of the world show excess cancer in construction workers, which is compatible with what we know about the exposures that I mentioned before. Cement and silica dust exposure, you have the lips, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, etc., and you have, of course, in particular, respiratory tract. And the asbestos exposure is associated with excess of the larynx, lung, and pleura, as we discussed yesterday. And above all, 
I think you could say that yes, stress-free exposure causes the highest risk in the fashion industry and should also be the easier one to eliminate, at least in the first place. You don't introduce it any longer if we and Europe didn't. This is what it looked like typically in the 70s. You were sawing the cement, asbestos cement sheets. This is a slide, as you can see, from, from Professor Hertwig's group in Wiesen. This is what it looks like nowadays when you have to take safety, take care of what has been installed long ago. And I would say in Europe, the European Union, this is a phase that everything is concentrated in now because since quite a number of years, the new, fresh move has been uh, uh, forbidden. Uh, I'm just wanting to uh, put the emphasis on the first line, which means that the consumption per capita is the highest in Russia. And I'm afraid it still is because most other countries have now uh, abandoned it uh, and it has been more and more difficult even for the Canadians to export. China, of course, produces a lot, but with the billions of inhabitants, gets less per capita. Uh, some of the Asian countries are still high, but why I mention this is, as you so long belong to this Russian system, I am convinced that there is an extremely large amount of asbestos here. Because in, in Russia, it is believed that it is not a health problem. The Canadians, they realize that it is a health problem because they don't use it at home. They just exported it until very recently. But this is why you should pay special attention, I think, to the asbestos problem in this country due to your historical past. Here we can see, in Sweden, we had at a maximum 20 uh, uh, million tons, which is very little, of course, a proportion of the world consumption. But what is most interesting here is a very narrow period while it was uh, import. We just had import, of course. And it went down here in the uh, early 70s very quickly. And I come back to that uh, time schedule later on. Uh, we will probably hear more from Carol about the different products you have for asbestos. I have just given them you in four typical groups. Uh, you sometimes forget that tixotropic capacity has been an important reason for why painting also grew up with mesotheliomas. It is much more understandable that the asbestos cement and, and insulation gives the exposure. Uh, this carpet, the floor carpet, have a lot of asbestos because it was alkali resistant and it was also a kind of, of reinforcement structure. And you will see later that the floorers also had some excess in mesothelioma. What is a problem here, which is not understood, I think, by everyone, is that the major ultimate asbestos end user is in construction industry. And that is not only in transition econom economies like yours, it is in every type of country. So construction uses the majority of asbestos containing products. At the same time, construction has, uh, to a very high extent, belongs to the informal sector. And you know how difficult it is to assess problems, retrieve patients from the past, so to say, in informal sector. And I think this is one of the reasons why it has been forgotten so long that this is a trade with uh, a major problem. We are back here to the Swedish import curve. This little P going down is probably when the shipyards decided not to use it any longer. And then we have a very rapid decline over less than half a year. And that was a result of our own findings of mesothelioma in this population in our cohort, showing the employers and the employees, and they together decided just directly, we don't use that problem, pro uh, problem, problem hmm, products any longer. We just get rid of them. And then, of course, there was no reason to import the asbestos and produce the asbestos cement products. It was a very quick uh, action by the social partners that later was followed up, of course, in, in terms of legal requirements by the authorities. It's interesting to see here that by that time, we have not gone very far in terms of the increase of mesothelioma cases in the country. It was just because we had the surveillance system ourselves in the multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary service structure which I was working with that we were able to tell them this truth. And now, as you can see in the next slide, this level of about 100 a year has continued 
and it has continued even up to 2009, women are more or less the same level all the time. So uh, around 370,000 examinees of our construction workers showed that those who were heavily exposed, and I will show the six groups later on, had uh, more than threefold excess of the dual tumors. The other professions had some. And altogether, the, the construction has a higher figure. What was important to, to observe was that when they were asked about their exposures during the health examinations early on, before, before all the asbestos discussions had come up, only 13 out of 85 knew that they were working with such a product. It was only those who saw the label ethany as an example who were. All the others were not. So it's not surprising that it took a long time to realize that asbestos is almost the only cause of mesothelioma because people didn't know that they had been exposed. This one is just to show that the highest incidence is found by those people in my own work cohort, 39, if you just forget about these very old ones. Then those who were born after 55 in our country, which means coming into the trade after the cessation in 67, uh, 76, uh, do not seem to have any mesotheliomas in the, say, 50, 55 year age group. Uh, but they had already so early in previous uh, studies. This is a very important slide and which is usable everywhere. You remember that we had around 20, 25 fatalities by accidents a year in the beginning. These are five year uh, aggregates. And then we have very few uh, mesotheliomas. But this period from 95 and forward, we have the same number of mesotheliomas in this cohort as we used to have fatalities by accidents before while the accidents are down to, as I said, one a month. So it is a very important contribution to the health and survival problem in construction workers. These are the six groups which I called the excess groups and electricians is a very surprising group that has turned out to be more and more in, in focus. I mentioned the floor layers, they are few, but they have a problem. And what is interesting here is that the large numbers, although not the large frequency incidence, is coming among the concrete workers and the carpenters. And the fact that managers also turn up has, of course, got to do with the fact that they have gone through the career and had exposure in the past. So uh, if we just summarize here, in our just about 370,000 construction workers examined between 71 and 93, there has been 422 mesotheliomas up to 2009. 20% of all male case cases in Sweden since the 90s, late 90s, are in this particular cohort. More or less, you could say, are construction workers, but there are, might be some construction workers who are not in the cohort. And above all, those born 1935 to 44 constitutes 35 to 40% of all, well, 35% of all those born in this period are in this construction cohort in, the, uh, uh, in, in Sweden. And the last diagram I showed you, 80% are not in those typical high risk groups. They are spread out over everyone, carpenters, uh, concrete workers, etc. So this all sums up the whatever you're going to do to make prevention in construction industry, you have to always come in early, a step ahead. If when you are doing the planning, the materials, no asbestos or chromium-6 cements, have the right equipment as we saw with this uh, construction worker from the past and his uh, successor in the late 80s, and the right equipment. And this will be my final message. Thank you very much, and thank you for permitting me to overuse the time somewhat. <coughs> thank you, and we do have time for some questions. If you could use the microphones and please introduce yourself. Uh, 
differences in the accident rates since there's a i assume is a changing group of ethnicity wise of workers is sweden is a very strange country because the construction workers in sweden belong to the socio economic top class it was a trade that protected itself in a way so there has been very little of other groups coming in except for a period from finland but finland and sweden are, are so close and, and there's no difference in, in income so we don't see that however the last say five ten years it's coming a change here because with the open european uh, politics people are moving it's a free move for work so lots of people are coming in from uh, the baltic countries poland whatever and there you have a different safety culture that is very obvious both on the management level and on the construction workers which i think will be become a, a problem other questions i will be presenting one slide on that in the case in the united states which is more mixed so there we do have uh, spanish hispanic workers and uh, i have one slide to address that So, so I said, I don't know what I'm saying. In Setak Shuma, Hetevial, no Haitia, Hamashara in practice, it's Haman and the Nachtin, a porta in Jamanak Neritz or professional Ivan Datsun and Tanarapes, unhappy mot, Ivan Dutun, Zargan Mamotarapes, Tasna Hink, Yev Avelitari, Ashkatarut Seto, and El Bavakan in Chapashpan was by Manerum. But virtually every Thank Thank you for this question, it's an important one. We can say that with the mesothelioma sphere, we are really talking about a very long latency period, up to 35 years, I would say, among the sphere. Uh, we have, that, that indicates probably that we have had a fairly low exposure, and we don't have any asbestosis cases since uh, the 1960s, early 1960s. We have the pleura plaques, but that, as you know, we heard yesterday, is an indication of exposure rather than a disease. But we do not see any of those very quick uh, developing, uh, quickly developing mesotheliomas. A very long latency period. And you, uh, Sverre, you might have some comments from Norway as well to this question, or? No, it was. We have done surveys in Norway as to the uh, l latency or development time for mesotheliomas. The, uh, the recent, um, I published a paper in uh, some few years ago on, on latency, current latency. Uh, uh, we are now running into the tail of exposures. So those getting mesotheliomas today, they always have all low exposure. But it, as of today, the, the average latency time from first exposure to um, development of mesothelioma is 46 years. 46 years. Thank you. Is there one more question? Or yeah. But we never had any short term. If, if you have short term uh, development time, you, don't, you haven't identified the exposure back in the early time. That's, the ex that's probably the explanation. Yes, uh, uh, Patahakan, 
արտայտություն չարեցի, ես տեսել եմ անրամասըն զեկուցներ այդուն է մեզ բրիտանի, այդ մասնարապես նույն շորլանջ այդվյալներով, որտեղ պարձապես են պիսի չարվորակ ընթացքով գնացող մեզատալի ոմաներ են և կանած մոտ հատկապես զվարանալի կարծիր, գոգորդի կարծիր, եվ այլը, նույն իսկ ընդեղի լսարանը, են ինձ մարել, ես ինչ չեմ համարում, են պիսի դեպք, որ վիճարկ կարող են առաջանալ և այդ աշխատողները բավականը մի քանի անգամ շնչեն ազբեստի փոշին և արդեն կարելի է հերթագրվել գերեզման գնալու համար։ Եսպեսի տպավորություն ստացվեց, ասեմ ձեզ ոչ բոլորին դա ենքանել հասկանալի եղավ պրովեսյոնալ հիվանդություն առաջանա, որպես պրովեսյոնալ հիվանդություն առաջանա երկու երեկ տարում։ Աստ ինձ, ես նորի գիտնական չեմ, բայց փորձ ունեմ բավականին, հայտում նաև ընթերցանության փորձ, ագին կարտում եմ դա շատ բավականին երկար ժամանակա պետք են էլ, պետք են էլ դար ինչ պայմաններում ամարդ աշխատել, կամ ինչ այլ կողնակի գործոններ ինձ եղել դրա համար։ they have developed with speed. Those who came were born after 55 and were around 20 when we had stopped this abrupt stop. They don't seem to have a diseases coming up during that follow-up period. And the, that's the only thing I can comment on from our experience of steel related to construction work. Uh, may I ask yeah. a question? Sure. Uh, it is, I, I just wonder if the reference made by the, <coughs> the British was to the duration of exposure. Duration can be very short, but, but the disease does not develop at the end of exposure. It develops in 30 or 40 years after that exposure. So that short duration exposures are associated with mesothelioma, but not immediately with pathology. I would also like to, to add something uh, because at uh, WHO conference on uh, asbestos as economic costs of uh, the consequences of the pro uh, occupational exposure to asbestos, uh, the experts from UK presented their data and economic costs. And indeed, you are quite right, the duration of exposure can be quite short and it can be still developed mesothelioma or asbestosis after uh, um, uh, required uh, period of latency. So it was not after a year or two developed, it's uh, the duration of exposure. And the data can be found at the link uh, um, which is available for the participants of WHO meeting on asbestos, but I can also give it to uh, the persons uh, if they are interested uh, in this data. Unfortunately, no one from Armenia attended the meeting, so we are uh, willing to give the link because all these data are there and all the calculations. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd, I'd like to go ahead because our next talk is also on, asbe on asbestos and I'm sure it will generate even more questions. Would you consider holding your question? Okay, one quick question. Ես ուզում էի հարցնել համաճայակաբանական հսկողության մասին, որովհետև այստեղ ներկայացվեցին տվյալներ, հիվանդացության։ Ես ուզում էի հարցնել համաճայակաբանական հսկողության 
ինչ տեսակ է իրականացվում ուրեմն հետազոտելու տարածվածությունը եւ ուրեմն վնասվածքների եւ հիվանդությունների եւ քանի որ բազմալ պրոֆիլ է այստեղ հա տարբեր ոլորտների քնթիր կա ինչպես են տվյալները ինտեգրվում մեկ համակարգի մեջ եւ այդ հսկողությունը այդ տվյալները ինչ աղբյուրներից է ստանում շնորհակալություն I'm talking about our system that started in 1969-70. It was a kind of very comprehensive medical questionnaire addressing both respiratory questions, back pain questions, and what have you. We had nurses in the first row, and with those cases where you had a problem, we had them referred to our own physicians who came out into the field regularly. So what we have been doing in, in the... Uh, let's say analytical part of the surveillance has been to look, look at different sets of questions or different measurements like spirometry or uh, hearing capacity just due to the problem that was under under study but we also in Sweden like in Norway have had a cancer registry nationwide since the late 50s and we have been able to link to that to see about these type of diseases which we were, would not be very likely to meet and detect in our health surveillance system. You, you need a very close cooperation with the national health service facilities for that. And that's probably where you have a problem when construction is in large part uh, informal sector work, you would not be able to catch them. So uh, it, it, it's uh, difficult to give a very simple question to your uh, answer to your question, but. Uh, I try, I try to help you. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Carol Rice. Dr. Rice is Professor Emerita from the University of Cincinnati Department of Environmental Health. She's an occupational hygienist and has practiced professionally and in academic research and training in worker health and safety education. She is, has a special interest in the use of historical exposure data to reconstruct past human exposures in occupational epidemiological studies. She organized the multi-state, multi-institutional Midwest Consortium for Hazardous Waste Worker Training, which includes site workers, emergency responders, and workers in a range of industri industrial settings. It also serves the needs of minorities and low-income residents potentially impacted by hazardous materials in their neighborhoods. Dr. Rice will speak to us today about asbestos, some more about asbestos, and other man-made mineral fibers. we're getting the electronics set up, I'll take a minute to say thank you for the invitation. This is um, an absolutely wonderful conference, uh, a beautiful country, and not one that was really on my travel plans. So this is a, a, a very pleasant uh, experience and a wonderful discovery. Uh, today I was asked to talk a little bit about asbestos and other fibers in construction. Um, based on some of the conversation yesterday, I inserted a couple of slides about, <coughs> unfortunately, this is a U.S. study, but it's the first really systematic uh, report that's been presented in the United States on the cost of um, uh, occupational injury and illnesses. <coughs> so that it's estimated using a lot, of uh, a lot of different data sources and economic models that the annual cost for injury and illness in the United States is $250 billion, which is pretty much every week. <laughs> um, and essentially, one of the reasons that we have a problem in the United States in terms of getting changes implemented is that you can see in the second part of the slide that the cost, that, that this cost is not borne by industry or workers' comp, it's really borne by society and the family. So the movement to try to enforce things through workers' comp or through the employer is not um, and a, a terribly effective pressure point. Um, it's also informative to look at disease category for these costs. 
and you'll see <coughs> that occupational injury and illness across all disease categories that were considered by this um, economist researcher ranked number two in terms of the disease burden in the United States. So only cardiovascular disease at $432 billion annually was ahead of occupational injury and illness. Um, we don't rank that high in the federal budget in terms of prevention, surveillance, remediation, but it is a very important drag on the U.S. economy. While the numbers would change, my guess is that that's true in other countries as well, um, that you know, depending upon the social insurance system, uh, more of it is paid centrally than in the United States, but it still is a very important contributor to health care costs in, in, in any country. So the source is here, and you can uh, look at all of, the, all of the data more. In construction, there really are different purposes for construction. New building, I think, gives us one unique opportunity for prevention and, and a solution. Renovation, reconstruction, and demolition is, is kind of a different category, so I'm going to separate those out in this talk. Asbestos is really quite pretty. It's also deadly. <laughs> um, the, the picture here that is brown is amosite asbestos, sometimes called brown asbestos, and the white fluffy stuff is chrysotile. But it's not just dust. Uh, there are a number of international programs to ban asbestos from use. The Collegium Ramazzini has a statement on this. Um, the Basel Convention that was mentioned yesterday does categorize asbestos as a toxic waste and does oversee uh, transportation across borders. And Armenia ratified that in 1999. For asbestos, because of the wide range of diseases that you've seen that asbestos um, causes, really our goal is no exposure. Uh, there is no good asbestos fiber to be inhaled. Uh, there will be debate, and the Canadians really um, led this debate, that chrysotile is sort of the safe asbestos. But it's not, it may be, some people do believe that it has less toxic effects than amosite or some of the other amphiboles. However, it's not safe. Uh, and if one characterizes it as safer than another one, that's quite different, another type of asbestos, that's quite different than saying it's safe. Um, the exposure occurs to workers. Um, importantly, it occurs to their family members, as you just heard about carry home exposure. And it occurs to community residents. So that, uh, and that's one of the um, exposure groups that can be very important, I think, here in Armenia from some of my observations. As an occupational hygienist, I'm sort of bound by duty and, and ethics to always go back to the hierarchy of control. Um, we believe as hygienists that the preferable kind of control is to eliminate or substitute and substitute with something safer. Um, that those are better alternatives to personal protective equipment and other kinds of practices that rely on many other people to implement. If we can remove the hazard, then we have won the game. Um, and that's sometimes true. I hope, hopefully that will be true eventually here in new construction, but it's um, can, dealing with the hazard, preventing and reducing it, will include in demolition and in renovation, will include containing the hazard. You saw it, um, the photo of uh, asbestos abatement workers in respirator and white Tyvek clothing um, to prevent, their, prevent them from inhaling it using ventilation and work practices. In new building, no asbestos will lead to no exposure. If you can substitute another product, um, that would be the best alternative. 
there are particular substitutes that are available and have been listed. I'll show you some for insulation purposes, for soundproofing, uh, for damping the um, uh, vibration in flooring, as was discussed, and uh, for general construction materials. I don't need to go over these. You can read them when they're on the website, but <laughs> asbestos cement pipe can be um, substituted with uh, ductile iron. There's a project here in Armenia that I'm going to show you very soon that um, clay pipe is a very good conduit for water as well. The exterior surfaces um, do not have to be asbestos board. They can be um, other kinds of fiber cement or brick um, and roofing materials are um, are available um, here that are um, a, a vinyl material or metal that could be used instead of the asbestos cement. <coughs> there are thermal insulation substitutes, uh, refractory brick, uh, refractory ceramic fibers, uh, high temperature soluble fibers, fibrous glass, um, slag wool. Now these None of these substitutes come necessarily with a clean bill of no hazard at all. Um, we have shown in one of our longstanding studies on refractory ceramic fibers that there is a risk of pleural plaques from RCF independent of, pre of any asbestos exposure. Um, pleural plaques are not a debilitating uh, health condition. They are they've always been characterized as a marker of asbestos exposure, but they can be a marker of other fiber exposure as well. <coughs> Silica has its own hazards that we saw yesterday, so, and there can be metals in the slag wool. So, but these hazards are easier to control um, in general than, uh, than the asbestos. There are substitutes sold here in Yerevan, and I was very um, lucky to have uh, with me who's sitting here and can hopefully help me answer questions. Um, take me to a supply house here in the city where we found fibrous glass um, in several different products. Um, the, the problem or the barrier to using this um, is cost. Uh, it only comes in, it's only imported in certain sizes from Germany. All of these products come from Germany. Um, one of them, however, is, you know, just a fabulous um, alternative to some of the asbestos products. It's adhesive on one side and fiberglass on the other so that you can actually adhere it. It's self-adhesive to, um, to a surface. Um, there are comp even longer listings of substitutes that will be available on the website. Renovation, construction, and demolition. Um, we use these factors of the date and the use of the structure and maintenance as some indicators in the United States. I think they're pretty universal um, in terms of trying to sort of figure out the risk. If you know when, when asbestos materials were used um, in construction, then you can have some indication as to whether or not it might be a hazard in a structure. Here, they have been used and they're continuing to be used, so that's kind of off the table. Um, maintenance and upkeep here, I think, are going to turn out to be one of the critical determinants. Um, and I've got a couple of pictures of that. Now, so that we all stay awake, um, one of the uses is, is spray-on insulation. How many of you have seen this used in Armenia? Was this ever used here uh, to spray on structural steel? I don't know. Um, but if you see this, be aware. Um, this is asbestos on pipe, as pipe insulation and not being well maintained. A very big part of dealing with asbestos is the awareness that you have asbestos. And looking at pictures imparts that sort of um, starts to develop that sensitivity. Um, here's some poorly maintained um, heating pipe um, asbestos insulation that could be in, for example, this could, could easily be in an apartment um, building where there are several apartments. Um, this is actually a product where you can see, if I can make this work, 
that there's asbestos here. This is fiberglass uh, with a covering over it. Uh, so it's kind of a mixed package of, of um, insulation material. And I think that is sort of similar to what we see in this picture that I took in Yerevan. Um, and there's a very long outdoor conduit here that has been insulated, but due to the factory closing, um, there has been no maintenance, and you can see that it's falling by gobs into the trees and onto the ground. Um, this is a hazard to any children who go play there, and ultimately the asbestos part can be become um, part of the soil and can be a community exposure concern. Uh, this is what it looked like in the United States, putting um, in uh, asbestos insulation early on, and there in many of those closed factories that I would wager this would be seen. Uh, when you see this, remember it's not just dust. Um, cleaning it up, moving it, you see this is not a good procedure. Uh, the person has work clothes on that will go home, so somebody else will be exposed in the house. They'll, a child will come up to this workman when he gets home, hug him around the legs. Where's the most exposure, most contamination of the clothing? Right in here. <laughs> Somebody will shake the clothes out before they wash them. So everybody's getting exposed. Roofing is a really important exposure route, I think, here in Armenia. It um, is used widely uh, when we went up to the monasteries on Sundays. Um, there are entire towns that are asbestos cement roofing. You've seen grinding um, photos of it today and yesterday. Here's somebody sawing it. Uh, not good. Uh, drilling. Each of these operations generates dust. I if an operation has to be done that can generate dust, the workers have to think about how that can be reduced. Um, you're not going to get everybody immediately to not use this kind of roofing. But wet methods, using water, spraying things with water and something called amended water is a control. Uh, and amended water is simply one cup of soap, suds, you know, dishwashing soap, added to 200 gallons of water. So, um, and there's a resource at the end of this talk that you can look all this up in. But keeping things wet reduces dust. We know this on roadways. We know this that if you're dusting at your house, you prefer to use a wet rag rather than dry. And it's not any of this is rocket science. This is a gasket around an oven that has become frayed. And this is what it looked like originally. So you can see that it, it became affected by the heat and was torn. This is asbestos cement pipe. Um, so there are two dangers with this. One is in cutting it, which is this picture. Um, and the other is that it's used for water. So water pipes um, can be delivering water to your house that are asbestos cement. Um, over time, the pH of the water starts to act on the cement, and that liberates the fibers into the water system. Um, and that is one of the projects that's going on in Armenia. So I have three examples. Um, in this village, asbestos cement water pipes are currently being replaced uh, and should be, and it would be a good project for students to follow up with to see if that's been done. Um, because according to the internet, by June 2013, it sh the project should be over. So even if it's behind schedule during the summer, you would hope. <laughs> um, roofing has deteriorated, not only for the chickens, but also for housing. This, um, I was told, just anecdotally, that 
when people remove this, either to replace it with new asbestos cement or um, to replace it with a, a good substitute, that it's put into sort of a community location and other people come and take it away. That's not good disposal. Uh, when the asbestos cement pipe is uh, uh, roofing is removed, it really should be removed using wet methods. It should be removed by people who don't get a lot of it on their clothing and take it home. And then it should be buried. It is considered hazardous waste. Uh, and it should be buried an, the prescribed number of feet under the ground so that it doesn't come back up. Um, there's currently a fairly large agricultural irrigation project going on here that illustrates another um, use of asbestos uh, that I don't have a picture of, but it's used um, in the pumping stations to help um, insulate a number of the transfer points. Um, this project has actually required that anyone uh, participating, any of the villages participating in this project, with more than one square meter of asbestos um, to be um, as part of the, the removal and, and renovation project, do asbestos abatement the way that it would be done in the United States. Um, I was very surprised as I was trolling through the internet that there are asbestos abatement companies that say they do business here. And I suspect it is comp driven by, it may be driven at least in part by this project. Uh, but it requires that you recognize the hazard. So that means that you really do have to have your eyes calibrated first. Then you can take a sample and there are microscopic um, methods um, to identify it in the bulk material. All of the workers have to be trained. Part of the training is in work practices that reduce exposure. The proper use of personal protective equipment, which is sort of the full garb that you saw in the, the photo in the previous presentation. How to decontaminate those, those people so that you don't just come out, take the respirator off, take the Tyvek off. You actually go through a shower. That water is collected because it is also hazardous waste. 